Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the Rode Hoot tonight. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being here with us, despite the very Dutch weather conditions today. We really appreciate it. And of course, a particularly warm welcome to our distinguished speakers tonight, Dr. Youssef Savani, Dr. Claudia Gazzini, and Dr. Tarek Mitri. I am Karin Wester of the Middle East and North Africa Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I will be moderating this evening, which we have organized jointly with the Leiden University Center for the Study of Islam and Society and the Van Vollenhoven Institute for Law, Governance and Society, also related to the University of Leiden. Before we get started, two household remarks. Um, first of all, if you haven't done so yet, please turn off the ringtones of your mobile phones. And secondly, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs organizes these Henriette van Linde lectures in order to provide a platform for debate on current affairs in the Middle East. However, as many of you know, the views expressed during these lectures do not necessarily represent the views of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Libya. In many ways, Libya represents a mirror image of Syria, which we discussed here in the same venue a few weeks ago. The countries are, of course, very different, but Whereas in Syria, the international community did not intervene militarily on humanitarian grounds in 2011 and 2012, in Libya, international military action was taken in March 2011, based on the principle of the responsibility to protect. And we may hear more about that later. Ultimately, the Libyan regime did fall, and in the autumn of 2011, after 42 years, the oppressive rule of Colonel Gaddafi came to an end. Initially, the period following the international intervention seemed to be marked by optimism and hope amongst most of the Libyan population. The National Transitional Council set out to reconstruct the country, and in July 2012, for the first time in 47 years, national parliamentary elections took place. However, in the course of 2013, the country gradually slipped into a downward spiral of violence and political instability. And since a few years, Libya mostly makes headlines as a state from which illegal migration, human trafficking, arms smuggling, and terrorism evolve. The international outcry over the slave trade coverage by CNN over the most recent weeks is just one recent example. Yet, as the leaders present at the EU-Africa summit in Abidjan last week stressed in a joint statement on the migration situation in Libya, and I quote, a lasting solution to the issue of African migrants is closely linked to addressing the root causes of the phenomenon and requires a political solution to the persistent crisis in Libya, unquote. A sustainable solution to the crisis in Libya, I would like to add, is first and foremost in the interest of the Libyan people themselves, but also in the interest of the region and of the international community at large. So that is what we will be focusing on tonight, the prospects for peace and reconciliation in Libya. Our three speakers all have in-depth knowledge of the country and they will address exactly this question. How to work towards a unified, stable, and prosperous Libya? 
Let me now introduce the first speaker to you, Dr. Youssef Savani. Dr. Savani is Professor of Politics and International Relations at Tripoli University. He is an expert on Libyan history and politics. In February 2011, he joined the Libyan uprising. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Arab Unity Studies and editor of the Journal of Contemporary Arab Affairs. His publications include the February 17 Intifada in Libya, Disposing of the Regime, and the Issues of State Building. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about those specific topics and the other issues we will address tonight. Mr. Savani, may I now invite you to take the floor. Please give him a warm welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wooster. I'm delighted to be here at this particular uh, gathering. And uh, I think uh, I'm very thankful to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to the University of Leiden to have been given the opportunity to speak on behalf of my own country, <clears throat> which has been witnessing uh, a bloody civil war for the last six years waves of civil war, actually, that has torn it apart, not only politically, but the deadly damaging effects of this civil war has really uh, gone down to affect, badly damage the very social fabric, social piece of this country, which is considered by international standards as upper middle income country, whereas ordinary Libyans today suffer a great deal and they queue for nights and days before commercial banks to be able to withdraw from their own personal bank accounts a few hundred Libyan dinars or sometimes tens of Libyan dinars which value has decreased almost 10 times fold over the last 10 years. With public services, the economy completely brought to its knees with no government functioning and has the capacity to provide the services, including emergency relief for the dis internally displaced communities or for the larger segments of society that have been hard hit by the crisis and the civil war. Why has Libya transformed from a prosperous country that was categorized as having a very high Human Development Index in 2011 by the United Nations to this kind of bleak, gloomy, uh, heartbreaking situation. I've lived in Libya for the whole of my life. I'm 60 years old. Apart from the few years that I spent in the UK for education, I've always lived in Libya. I had to quit this long, uh, uh, you know, passion for working and, and staying in Libya only after 2012, when things started, or appeared to me, someone who really worked for reform in, during the regime era and joined the uprising, supported the uprising, that things were really going into the wrong direction. I'm not going to any details about how the internationals acted in 2011, why they agreed on uh, undertaking a joint action to topple the Gaddafi regime, uh, and uh, for what particular interests or reasons, were it purely humanitarian, or there were 
real politic issues behind that. That's probably for the historians, but I can direct you to a number of scholars who have extensively researched and written about this and unveiled many of the truths that had long been hidden. Libya is a modern and new entity. It was created by the United Nations in 1951. And for what reason? Because the internationals then, the great powers, didn't agree on dividing the country among us them. A trusteeship failed to materialize. Then the best option seemed to be give this country independence. So it was the first case of a country created by the United Nations, and it was hailed as a success, even though the mission that the United Nations sent to Libya at the time said there was no prospects for this to be an independent state. And it was named the Kingdom of Sand. It was the poorest country on earth at the time. Nevertheless, God gifted or Mother Nature gifted the Libyans with oil and gas. And the country became prosperous. Uh, a monarchy was set up for 18 years. The monarch ruled the country. There were corruption all over the place, but there was development as well. Then Gaddafi and a group of army officers seized power in a bloodless coup or a revolution, they, and they ruled the country for 42 years. Their action was met with appreciation. It was very popular. They gained the legitimacy and appreciation of the things they were doing on behalf of the Libyans. Many of the public services, education, schools, hospitals, free housing, um, guaranteed job for graduates or school leavers, everything was really there. The whole, probably, function of the government was to distribute the wealth, either in cash handouts, salaries for state employees who you know, not necessarily were doing any worthwhile job, but they were on the government payroll. Uh, and then the rest of the story is known. Gaddafi, you know, turned nasty, became a dictator, authoritarian, oppressed the people, human rights were violated, he had problems with the West, terrorism. The best thing was to get rid of him. Um, protests broke out in 2011. Uh, the internationals came to the rescue, and here we are. This new state that was created in 1951 by the United Nations was probably the first instance in which the whole geographical area known now as Libya was brought under one authority. Hitherto, it was divided under the sovereignty of its neighbors, it went under different kinds of occupations, uh, the latest of which was the Italian occupation, which lasted just about three decades. During those years, or this, th those decades, the Libyan nation was not really realized. The state was ruled by non-Libyans, Gaddafi, was probably the only exception. He was a Libyan. The monarch, which he toppled, was an Algerian. And before that, there were the Italians, and during the Ottoman or the Karamanlis, there were either Albanians, Mamluks, or Turks, Ottomans, or probably then the Spaniards, the Knights of Malta, uh, you know, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Vandals. The central government has always been, or had always been before Gaddafi, 
alien to society. Nationhood was a new creation. National identity was in the making during the monarchy, nevertheless. But Gaddafi interrupted that and introduced his own vision of identity, which was ban Arab, and then turned ban Islamic, then back to ban Arab, then ban African. So one important aspect to be considered when trying to understand the current situation is this historical background. Libya has never become a nation state. National identity was still in the making. Integration has not as yet taken place. There were, it was in its genesis, so to speak. This is also could be considered as an explanation of why there were not only one uprising against Gaddafi, but there were many uprisings. There were local uprisings, tribal uprisings, regional uprisings, ideological uprisings. Different issues, different causes were behind the uprising. They all were united in trying to get rid of Gaddafi, which thanks to the international happened with the intervention. This brings us back to what I usually call the permanent or perennial factors that can explain the current Libyan state. Tribalism is, in addition to regionalism, are the essential perennial factors that can explain what happened in 2011 and afterwards. And they explain why there are at least now 1,600 militias, armed militias in Libya, that not only compete with whatever they're of central power, but they carve their you know, national wealth, geography, up to their own agendas. Because the concept of the nation state is not there. It's still the primordial, tribal, regional, or religious as well. The entire economy in which the whole function of the government is to distribute the wealth among us, the populace, is the other perennial factor that explains why Gaddafi was able to buy the consent of Libyans for decades, and why he then failed to continue with that situation and had Libyans turning against him, or parts of Libyans turning against him at least. It also explains why the first thing, the National Transitional Council, which led the revolt against Gaddafi in 2011 and was bestowed upon with legitimacy as the sole representative of Libyan people by the internationals, rushed into controlling state assets and distributing them in whatever manner that turned out to be leading the country into actual bankruptcy. It is the rentier economy mentality and attitude that has no place for the common public good or even an appreciation of work as a social value or social capital and its importance. So the, 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 the uh, rentier mentality is dictating the attitudes of the government, authority, and the people as well. And there was no need for any social or political contract between the state and government, and state and society. The other important factor is that of foreign interference. I said that Libya was ruled by foreigners for most of its history. After the fall of the regime, foreign interference intensified in Libya. 
with militias and political factors being cronies or acting on behalf of regional actors, Arab and non-Arab, for a variety of, of interests. And this, so far, has been very obstructive to any project to build a new state. The center has not been able to infiltrate the periphery for most of at least contemporary history of the, of the country, apart from the, the decades of Gaddafi, which coincided with, 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 uh, with this revolutionary uh, image, uh, with charisma probably, uh, with uh, Cold War rivalry, uh, with also the abundance of oil or petrodollars that, that were at disposal of the regime. But now it is regional confrontation more than internal confrontation. The United Nations has been attempting to broker a deal among the Libyan factions. This deal has so far failed, simply because it's based on power sharing approach. It assumes state and authority and institutions are there and it's just for the competing, contesting factions to come together and agree on a formula to share power. Well, this is not the case. State, power, government, authority, institutions have to be created first before we think about power sharing. Well, this is why the Libyan political agreement sponsored by the United Nations is going into the wrong direction so far. I think the the, probably the, the current representative of the Secretary General is trying his best to modify, amend uh, the, 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 the situation and propose different tracks. Libya's future will very much depend on an understanding of those dynamics and this should lead to a logic, an approach that puts national reconciliation first. This is the right entry point for resolving the conflict because in national reconciliation, you are not only bringing the contesting f factions or regions or tribes together for a power sharing, but for agreeing, having consensus on a social or societal contract. Societal in the wider sense, it's not only social. Societal, creating a common vision for the future of the state. What is Libya? What does it mean to be Libyan? What does it mean to be in, in this particular geographic location? Are we Arabs? Are we Africans? Are we Maghribans? Are we from the Mediterranean? Or are we just Libyans? I mean, what kind of identity for this country? What kind of government system? What relationship between state and society? These are all components of a vision that should be the basis for the constitution and government institutions that have to be created or state institutions, then we go to the rest of transition uh, uh, mechanisms or techniques like elections uh, and so on and so forth. But so far, this has not been uh, uh, attempted. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the focus on, on, on the future uh, should be uh, on uh, reaching this uh, formula, realizing this formula, while at the same time addressing marginalization, uh, feelings of tribes and regions, uh, uh, thus uh, understanding the negative impact of frontier economy and how it worked in the last few decades by thinking of a new uh, uh, strategy 
so to speak, to deal with the wealth that Libya is supposed to have and how to distribute it uh, equally among us Libyans. Uh, I think these are the most important issues uh, for the time being to focus on, uh, but uh, I wholeheartedly hope that uh, the, 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 the current uh, Secretary General, Special Representative in Libya, Hassan Salama, uh, is, is, is able to uh, provide a more inclusive approach, because without such an approach, uh, there is no hope for Libya to uh, get rid of the current situation, avoid another civil war, and I think uh, the war probably will even come closer to Europe than it has already been. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Savani, and thank you for pointing out that the uh, current problems Libya is facing um, have not emerged in, in a vacuum, but that they have actually also roots in, in, in a long history in which certain patterns have emerged. Um, I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Tarek Mitri. Um, Tarek Mitri received his PhD in political science from the University of Paris 10, and he was a lecturer at St. Joseph University in Beirut. His main areas of interest include the history and sociology of relations between Christians and Muslims. He held several ministerial positions in Lebanon, including Minister of Culture and Minister of Foreign Affairs. From 2012 to 2014, Dr. Mitri was the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Support Mission in Libya. He currently serves as the Director of the Issam Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Relations at the American Institute of Beirut. Please give Mr. Mitri a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to be here. Um, as elsewhere in the region, the radical transformations in Libya opened up new opportunities and raised new promises. But uh, the Libyan experience, and one could say the same about other experiences, illustrates the fact that transition, any transition, is fraught with risk. The aspirations of revolutionaries, in the case of Libya, contrasted with the realities of a civil war. Whether explosive, Civil wars can be explosive or marked by low intensity, punctual confrontations. The legacy of four decades of despotic rule, the reactivated enmities, the reinvented hatred that is called at times ancestral hatred. Regional polarization, proxy rivalries, and what I would like to describe as a retreat of the international community. All of those factors combined explain Libya's descent into chaos, instability, and uncertainty. Many of Gaddafi's policies were purposefully or inadvertently as designed to atomize the population. A culture, if I may use the word, of non-statehood was widespread. 
In the post Gaddafi dispensation, the weakness of a civic and democratic culture was manifest. Excessive politicization of public administration, mistrust, and exclusion reduced the state institutions, which were previously weakened by parallel structures that Gaddafi had created, parallel to the army, there were brigades, parallel to the police, there were committees, parallel to every institution, there was another that was meant to weaken the main institution. All of this uh, led to a minimal existence with little, if any, credibility and efficiency. When I was appointed as the representative of the Secretary General, I was told by the Security Council, you go and work on reforming institutions. I remember security sector reform. It, uh, security sector reform, I heard it a million times, ad nauseam. There was no security sector to reform. There, uh, there was a sec security sector to build. And you were giving tools to reform, and the task is to build. The tools were not commensurate to the task. There were early signs of non-commitment or even rejection of rebuilding military and security institutions. I think military and security institutions are key to the rebuilding of other state institutions. The revolutionaries and their numbers were inflated. Uh, probably 10 or 15,000 took up arms during the revolt against Gaddafi, but those who call themselves revolutionaries and who carry arms in today's Libya are more than 200,000. Uh, th these revolutionaries, self-proclaimed revolutionaries, self-appointed revolutionaries, refused to disarm until they could trust those who will represent the nascent state. And those who were in charge of the new state, the new political elites of Libya, argued that the presence of these armed men was a hurdle to the building of the state. So the new political elite and those revolutionaries were in actual fact using each other as, as a justification for not allowing the building of the state. Uh, we had a very sad experience of the adoption by the General National Congress, the Constituent Assembly, of a law that was called the Political Exclusion Law, which is, uh, which is as bad, perhaps in some ways worse, than the so-called debathification law in Iraq. Those of you who know a little about Iraq, uh, you were excluded from politics and public service, not because of what you did under Gaddafi, but because of what you were. If you happened to be uh, an ambassador of Libya in India, uh, that was enough to be excluded by this law. So the logic behind that law was that of a civil war logic, that there were winners and losers, and losers had to be excluded. Uh, now, uh, the weak state is weakened further by this law, but no one really cared. There was much more energy in getting this law passed than energy in 
trying to limit its uh, effect on, on state building. Power sharing between the inexperienced, inexperienced emerging members of the political elite took precedence over state building. And that's the crux of the matter. Uh, sometimes I used to joke with Libyan politicians. That I say, you, you, you fight over the spoils of the state before the state itself emerges. Uh, so power sharing, competition over power, took precedence over state building from day one. Political competition mobilized energies that would have been better invested in searching for a national consensus on the priority of building institutions and of learning how to uh, practice inclusionary politics, at least in the first phase of the transition. But inclusionary politics was an alien uh, concept, both to the Libyan elite, but also to some of the transitologists, people who thought the transition is from dictatorship to democracy is election, constitution, election. Uh, exclusionary politics, whether through a law such as uh, political exclusion law, or through elections, because elections can be an instrument of exclusion when winner takes all or thinks that he or she takes all, and where loser thinks that he, that he or she is excluded, and better protect yourself by whatever means you have to survive. And this is what has happened in Libya. Uh, it was very clear from the very first elections that this, uh, this is what may happen, and it happened. If things can go wrong, they go wrong, and they went wrong. Uh, one should mention also, concomitantly, the reaffirmation of subnational identities, whether tribal, whether regional, whether even uh, city uh, identities. You know, I'm from Misrata. You, you know, I, 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 I heard people make endless lectures about how great was Misrata, Sparta, uh, uh, or any other city for that matter. Uh, how much time do I have? Five more minutes? Yeah. Uh, so in this context, the UN notion of transition, as I said, encouraged elections and, uh, and constitution-making uh, process. And both elections and constitution-making process were Libyan demands. So the Security Council was happy. There is Libyan ownership. Libyans want elections, we give them elections. Libyans want a constitution, we help them draft a constitution. Uh, because, of course, people wanted elections. They've been deprived of normal political life for more than 40 years, and they saw other countries, they have televisions, they see people cast their ballot in the ballot box. Uh, and they have lived without a constitution <laughs> for so many years, so it was good to have a constitution. Uh, for them, that was the sign that new Libya is democratic. Elections were rushed, and therefore they exacerbated divisions. Rather than healing divisions, they exacerbated them, as I said, because of the majority-minority. Elections in, in, in fragmented countries may lead to majority tyranny. Despotic, uh, rule leads to minority tyranny, but, uh, but sometimes elections in societies that are not prepared, fragmented, lead to majority tyranny. 
uh, we or I mean the Libyans, of course, the Libyans. We helped them organize elections in July 2012, legislative elections. Two months later, those who were a majority became a minority. A new majority has emerged. No one really knew who is who. who uh, uh, and then they started from early on to think about when we should get rid of this body that we have elected. Uh, I had arrived a month after, after the election of the General National Congress, and I heard scores of people tell, telling me, when are we going to get rid of them? Let's have an anticipated round of new elections. And we had an, another round of elections in July 2014, almost uh, one and a half years following that. We had in, uh, in between two elections, the, uh, the Constitution Drafting Assembly was elected in February 2014, and we had municipal elections that went on from uh, October to April, uh, October 2013 to October 2014. I mean, I lived in Switzerland. You know, Switzerland is known for uh, uh, direct democracy. They have not had four elections in three weeks. They, they never had four elections in three years. Libya had four elections in three years. And the more elections we had, the more. Uh, so the, 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 the magic formula of transitology, going from election to constitution to election, did not work. And all those elections were immediately contested. No one contested the vote counting. Everybody said free and fair. They were free and fair. They were extremely well done. That was a pleasant surprise. We, all of us were, couldn't believe it, you know, that people went to the ballot box, did their duty in the best possible way. The counting of votes was transparent. There were as many observers as you, you think thousands of observers from all over. Uh, so free and fair, yes. But immediately contested, not, not because of uh, the mechanics of the elections, but because of the outcome of the elections. Um, one, the turnout was always low, and it was lower and lower and lower, which also challenges the theory that, that the Libyan people were dying to see uh, ballot boxes. Uh, two, they, uh, the constitution of lists and the choice of candidates was uh, submitted to uh, military pressure. The, the way uh, elected assemblies legislated uh, was so much marked by this Damocles sword of military brigades over the heads of the legislators. There were, I was a witness to, uh, to commissions in parliament drafting a law literally with a gun in the head of the legislator drafting the law. So, um, and, and much of the discussion was about, irrespective of results of elections, was about power sharing. How do we share power? Uh, there were attempts of dialogue. I mean, the wheel is not, cannot be invented and reinvented infinitely. I mean, uh, we had a, a number of dialogue initiatives, but we failed to get the dialogue exercise move. Uh, it's focus from power sharing arrangements to uh, agreeing on uh, national priorities, reshaping national identity, redefining the, the nature of the state, uh, and building state institutions. Um, Dialogue failed because it was always seen as a round of political negotiations. And the threat to any dialogue uh, today and tomorrow will be that, the, uh, that 
of the predominance of a logic of political negotiations. You know, I used to, when I used to work in, in another world, uh, I used to use the metaphor, the following metaphor. I say, dialogue is not um, an ambulance or a fire extinguisher. When there is fire uh, somewhere, or when people are fighting, then you bring in dialogue and you, you uh, extinguish the fire. Uh, dialogue is more of a prophylactic medicine. It's a medicine you take that strengthens your immunity. Uh, uh, dialogue is a cumulative thing. It's preventive. Uh, it's not curative. You cannot treat a problem with dialogue. <laughs> but dialogue can empower you to be able to, uh, to uh, deal with the problem. Uh, I remember... Uh, just a month before, and I, I'm concluding, just a month before uh, the elections of June, 20, June 2014, we saw that a big battle over Tripoli was in the making. And, you know, they're getting their arms ready and aligning their, their uh, armored vehicles and... Uh, uh, and grouping their soldiers and everything. It was coming, everybody uh, saw it coming, at least I saw it coming. And so I invited, I invited the political leaders to dialogue. And I said, now this is the time to dialogue on one single issue, how to avoid the bloodbath in Tripoli, how to prevent the resort to the use of arms to settle political disputes. How is it that we can solve political problems with political means rather than personal disagreements with military means? And uh, it's easier, of course, it's easier said than done. But then I had people who came to me and said, tomorrow there will be elections and we are going to win. There is a general in, uh, in Benghazi called Haftar who started his Operation Dignity and is making headway uh, in, uh, in, in Benghazi. Why do you want us to make concessions at a time where we seem to be winning? Again, then the logic of winning and losing, of therefore excluding instead of including, negotiating instead of dialoguing. And I think the future of reconciliation in Libya depends largely on being able, I know political negotiations are necessary, inevitable, but on being able to strike a balance between political negotiations and genuine dialogue that is, that is meant uh, to reinvent Libya, to reinvent being together in Libya. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mitri, and also um, thank you for teaching us, or at least me, a new word, transitologists. <laughs> I think probably you have quite a few of them in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but I didn't know there was a term for them. <laughs> Our third speaker tonight is um, Claudia Gazzini. She holds a PhD in Middle Eastern history from Oxford University, was a researcher at the European, U in, U European University Institute in Florence, and a visiting fellow at the Northwestern University. Her academic research on Libya has been published in various media outlets. She served as senior analyst for Libya for the International Crisis Group from 2012 to 2017. And we actually invited her to speak here tonight in that specific capacity. Meanwhile, however, she has joined the United Nations support mission in Libya as policy advisor to the current special representative of the United Nations Secretary General, Ghassan Salami. We're very happy to have her also in that capacity, but once again, we invited her to come and speak here in her previous capacity working for the International Crisis Group. Mrs. Cassini, you now have the floor. Please give her a warm welcome.
Thank you for hosting this event tonight. The two speakers before me uh, highlighted some issues that I fully subscribe uh, with. Uh, Dr. Sawani uh, highlighted how for Libya to move from a current state of anarchy towards stabilization, how it needs a new societal contract to get the different factions, different constituencies to work together. Absolutely, that is true. Dr. Mitri um, highlighted another feature that is necessary in Libya today, which is the fact that the country needs, or Libyans, need to learn to practice more inclusionary politics. And he ended his, his uh, talk tonight by, by saying that Libya and Libyans need to strike a balance between political negotiations and dialogue. Absolutely, these two points that were raised are essential for uh, the path ahead. But I think there's another element that needs to be discussed, and this is what I will concentrate the next 10, 15 minutes of this talk on. Um, Libya also, Libya and Libyans also need to move away from a dominant culture of predation, which the country is victim of. What do I mean by culture of predation? It's a culture that allows individuals to tap into the country's wealth and take it for personal interests, personal use, or the use of your own constituency. Libya is a rentier economy, as we know, and as Dr. Sawan uh, mentioned earlier. It depends, 95% of the economy depends on oil sales, crude oil revenues. Um, um, up until 2011, Libya was exporting about 1.6 million barrels uh, a day of crude oil. And that allowed, in the prosperous years of high oil prices, allowed the country to stack away uh, billions of dollars of worth uh, in excess revenue in a, national, in a sovereign wealth fund. That even in, 19, in, in 2013, so two years after the war, um, was uh, estimated to have about $80 uh, um, billion dollars of reserves. The total amount of reserves of foreign currency that the country had in 2013, the beginning of 2013, when I started looking at the economic dimension of the Libyan crisis, was a good $130 billion between reserves of the central bank and the reserves uh, and the accounts of the sovereign wealth fund. Well, now those foreign currency reserves are down to about 30, between 30 and $40 billion. The country has depleted its, current, its foreign currency reserves at an astonishing pace, at the pace of 20, 30 billion dollars a year, a year. Why? Multiple factors have contributed to that. Um, first of all, in 2014, armed groups or individual constituencies started closing off um, the oil and gas infrastructure. Closures of pipelines have cost the country billions of, uh, of dollars. At some point when oil production went down, to oil exports went down to two, 300,000 uh, barrels a day as opposed to the 1,600,000 in, in the normal days, the country was losing more than $100 million a day uh, in, in, uh, in revenues. This meant that from 2013, up until this year, the country has been incurring a GDP deficit in, in some years of up to 50%, um, uh, 50%. These are record figures. Already being in a double digit uh, GDP deficit is, is, is worrying, but when you reach 50, 56%, as was the case in 2015, it is extremely worrying. So the closure of oil and gas infrastructure was the first sort of sign of the declining um, uh, of this culture of predation that allows an individual group to, um, to use its military power or its political power uh, to, to uh, attack or in some cases just close off um, uh, infrastructure for um, 
political leverage or for personal gain. But over time, that started in 2013, but in the last three years we've seen an incredible um, array of very creative ways for individuals to tap into these state uh, uh, financial resources. Um, we've seen um, the issuing of letters of credit for Libyan firms, letters of credit uh, that you know, allows an individual or a company to purchase imported goods. Letters of credit were issued uh, in Libya uh, for the import of things like baby milk, uh, clothes, uh, spare parts, and so on. But what arrived in Libya were empty containers. Instead of a million dollar worth of baby milk, which was the reason why a letter of credit was issued, you'd have an empty container that docked in Tripoli port or in Benghazi port. With the result that businessmen or in individuals or companies were able to pocket millions of dollars worth of foreign currency abroad and bring them back into the country without actually having purchased the goods that they were meant for. The, dis the souring exchange rate over the past two years has fueled this practice. The official exchange rate for the Libyan dinar to the dollar is 1.3 Libyan dinars to a dollar. Now, it's impossible to purchase foreign currency at that exchange rate. Only the black market um, is the, the source for the purchase of foreign currency. And today, the exchange rate at the black market is almost 10 Libyan dinars to a dollar. That means that in a country like Libya, where most of the people depend on imported goods, even for their food stuff, because very little is grown in the country, most of it is imported, uh, inflation has risen exponentially, and uh, getting by in Libya has become harder by the day. But this discrepancy between the official exchange rate and the black market exchange rate has actually allowed individuals to become millionaires overnight, and all the while has impoverished the middle class Libyan. Your average Libyan is much poorer today than they were before. An average Libyan receives a salary of about 1,000 dinars a month. 1,000 dinars was about 800, 850 dollars a month. Now that 1,000 dinars is equivalent to 100, 100, 150 dollars. And not always you can access it, because as Dr. Sawani mentioned, there is a problem of cash availability, and many people even struggle to get few hundred dinars out of their bank accounts. People queue cold weather, rainy weather, hot weather, for hours on end in front of the banks, hoping to get something out of their bank accounts. People get killed while waiting in line in front of the banks to get money from their, from their bank accounts. Then you have another layer of predation of state resources. Of course, that's the ones of the militias. Uh, you know, militias that kidnap uh, an individual and ask for money uh, in ransom. Um, militias who hold managers of state institutions or companies hostage to their demands. Militias who uh, militias that um, request um, catering contracts uh, through which they themselves make a profit, make a cut. Uh, militias who traffic, or individuals linked to militias who traffic in human uh, trafficking migrants uh, and make profit from that. But it's even deeper than that. You have individuals who profit from smuggling of all sorts of goods. Our estimate, I remember at Crisis Group, we tried to do an estimate of how much people were profiting from the migrant trade, and we estimated it was about a, a billion dollars a year. Uh, smuggling of refined fuel is worth perhaps two, three billion dollars a year. How does this work? This is imported fuel that Libya uses or the state purchases at international prices that is brought into the country, subsidized at the equivalent of two euro cents a liter that smugglers 
purchase in Libya and then smuggle out again, making about 30, 40 cents of profit per liter of, uh, of refined fuel and diesel. This generates up to two, three billion dollars a year in profits for Libyan smugglers and their foreign counterparts. Um, it's not only the militias, it's not only the smugglers, but the culture of predation also exists within the political elite in Libya. Because actually, this is the most unfortunate thing, holding a position of power in Libya oftentimes becomes, an, uh, becomes cinnamon of being in a position that allows you to tap into these state resources. So, um, so this, is the, uh, this is where Libya stands today. And when I'm asked, will the country succeed in coming out of the crisis, or will the UN or the new special envoy succeed in, in fostering a new political agreement, uh, that will sort of change the dynamics in the country? Will we be able to go beyond Skhirat, which is the political agreement that was mentioned earlier that fostered this power sharing um, setup which the, current, the country currently has? Well, my answer to all those questions is it depends on what happens with the Libyan economy. It depends whether we're able to break this cycle of predation that is ubiquitous in the country. But unfortunately, we have very little resources. We, I say we as international community, have very little resources to deal with this illegal triumph of, um, uh, sort of the triumph of the illegal economy in Libya. Both the formal economy and the informal economy is difficult to handle. Um, as UN, we, as the UN, throughout the past three, four years, has always maintained a distance from the economic sphere uh, because it was more involved in the political dialogue or attempting to pursue a political agreement. Uh, because in part its energies were also focused on the security sector. And there's no doubt that you know it's essential to have a political agreement. It's essential to have. Uh, security sector building, not reform. Uh, it's essential to in, engage in these two things, but it's equally as essential to, to break this cycle of predation if we want any political agreement to work. Um, so I don't have an answer of whether, whether Libya has prospects for peace and, and reconciliation. I, I dearly hope so, uh, but I, what I can say is that uh, those that prospect of peace and reconciliation will be greater if we, uh, if we and if Libyans themselves uh, work more to solve the economic crisis, to bridge the gap that exists between in, in the economic institutions, and help um, um, sort of uh, cut off this pervasive culture of predation and transform uh, in transform it into something more constructive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Cassini. Thank you very much. And um, I think we've now heard um, three very rich and thought-provoking uh, presentations. And I will open the floor uh, up for questions um, in a minute. But perhaps there is one aspect on which you could elaborate uh, more, all three of you, um, perhaps briefly, and that is the security sector. You've all mentioned it, I think, in your presentations, but um, as of 2011, uh, the, um, all the militias that existed, had the, the demobilization, disarmament, um, and reintegration into some sort of unified national army has not made a lot of progress, if I, may, if I may say it in that way. And we were just discussing it over dinner. There are perhaps still 200,000 people registered as revolutionaries, and they're on the payroll also of the government. So how do you see this specific, very important question evolve in the forthcoming period? And what do you think 
should ideally speaking be happening in this field of the security sector? So perhaps, Dr. Savani, I could ask you first for your views on this. Thank you. Uh, I don't really believe in sequencing the interventions. Uh, I think everything has to uh, uh, be embarked upon at the same time. This is why I advocate a process of national reconciliation that includes a number of components, including building security and an economic recovery plan. And this should go hand in hand with the national dialogue that should result in adopting a common vision for the future of the country and its political institutions, economic system, national identity, and definitely a constitution and what comes you know, thereafter. Uh, what has been attempted and failed regarding security sector reform or DDR is the uh, transformation of titles of militias into so-called official brigades as either part of the Ministry of Defense or brigades also, militias, into security and police under the, in, uh, the formal uh, uh, authority of the Ministry of the Interior. I mean, this goes against all international best standards established when it comes to DDR. You don't integrate whole brigades of militias into the army or into the security institutions. Mm -hmm. You include them individually according to a set of criteria, standards, professionalism, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's all known. And there are different experiences to, to learn from. What happened is that as early as the political division took place right after the elections, or probably even before the first elections, that each party, each, each political faction, each region, each tribe, or political group attempted to give some kind of state legitimacy to the brigades, the militias that are its loyalists, so to speak. So Islamists and their major military force, Misrata City, set up the so-called Libya Shield Force. Zintan and its supporters set up other institutions. Revolutionaries in Tripoli and its regions set up a permanent security commission, something uh, which is supposed to, to be uh, acting like security and police. And the, the, the fact that all those formations reflected the division that has already taken place since the outest. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, no one ever speaks about DDR or security sector reform. I mean, and you have more than a you know, catch-22, as they say. I mean, not only militias are defending and they want to keep their, their, uh, their privileges that they have accumulated and, you know, uh, what uh, Claudia has already talked about, the squandering and the misappropriation of public funds, but the contestation has become multi-level. It's vertical and horizontal. Uh, it includes tribalism, regionalism, ethnicity, political. It's no longer even an Islamist and non-Islamist contestation. Thank, it's thank you very much. It's even more complex. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, Mr. Mitri, would you like to reflect briefly on this matter? So afterwards, we'll yeah, move there, on to there, there is no recipe, of course. But there are a number of things we need to know and do. I would like to know if there is an army in Libya. Everybody refers to Haftar as the commander-in-chief of an army. I don't know what Haftar has. I mean, all those that carry arms under the flag of Haftar, are they an army? Are they a national army? Who knows? Who knows? No. So uh, let's, I think some effort has to be made to understand uh, whether the project of rebuilding the army has started or not. Two, I think it's better 
and uh, to give priority to the rebuilding of police force and uh, border security force. That's more of an urgency than an army in Libya. Uh, and you know, armies and ambitions and uh, coup d'etats everywhere in the world have been staged by armies, not by police. Anyway, I'm not going to, to get into much into this, but Libya needs a police force and a border security. Three, you have to develop a system that I, uh, in a way, I link up with some of the things that uh, um, Claudia mentioned. You need to incentivize people to join the police force. They had no incentive in the past. The incentive, in fact, was more in favor of staying with, within brigades. They, they made more money being part of a revolutionary brigade than joining the police force. There should be incentives, a, a bundle of incentives, moral, financial, and uh, that would allow you uh, to, to build the police. And then, and then I have heard the whole world, NATO, France, uh, Italy, Britain, Germany, you name it, that, that they want to train the Libyans, Soviet, train the police. Uh, for some reason, we, I think when I was there, I heard talk and talk and talk and talk about training, and nothing happened. And even there are countries that cashed money in advance for uh, training, and, and no training happened. Um, but as I said in the beginning, there is no recipe. I don't have a plan. I'm fortunate to be a retired uh, <laughs> person, so I can say what I want. I'm not accountable. You won't hold me accountable for having failed to build the police. Yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe let's then move on to someone who's not yet retired. Claudia, would you like to offer your reflections on this matter, or shall we move on to questions no, no, from the I'll audience? Very, just yeah. very briefly. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I, I have... When I was with Crisis Group, uh, one of the issues that I was always reminding my international interlocutors was that the security sector approach of the UN mission, you know, just before Sherat and after Sherat, was very limited in its focus, um, uh, meaning that the, you know, in 2015 and after the implementation of the Libyan political agreement, um, the UN security sector approach was mainly directed at uh, creating an area in Tripoli for the internationally recognized government to operate. So allowing the government uh, or the presidency council to return to Tripoli and allowing that government to operate in Tripoli. So really all the resources of the UN were mainly directed at at, at Tripoli, and this was my main criticism at the time, saying, you know, you're not having, you're not taking a national approach to security sector problem. You're just trying to uh, consolidate or clean up Tripoli to allow the international government to operate. So I think that's that's the that is the big um, heritage that we find ourselves with today to switch from this Tripoli only as I used to call it, the triply only approach to, uh, to Libya all approach. And I think as the political focus of the mission also starts to change, or, or has already changed from, you know, only engaging with the presidency council, which was the, 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 the mantra of the last two years, to let's reunite the institutions, let's bridge the gap, let's bring these two rival governments um, uh, together, let's try to unify the state institution. So as the political vocation of the UN mission becomes national, so does the security sector approach have to, has to become national. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you for your answers. And um, I would now like to move on to questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and identify yourself briefly and please ask uh, one question at a time. We'll take a number of questions and then we'll um, move back to the speakers. I see the gentleman here in the middle who raised his hand. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kirsten Dijmeijer. I have a question about the involvement of the uh, neighboring countries uh, in uh, Libyan internal affairs, of Tunisia, Algeria, and Egypt. Uh, do you consider their involvement a, a positive factor or a negative factor? 
Thank you. That was a very clear and uh, concise uh, question. Um, other, I saw other hands raised. Is the lady here in the, in the middle, if you can reach her. Hello, my name is Rocio Lopez, uh, and my question is about regional interest. Uh, you have a hint uh, at it, at the existence of some uh, regional interest. And I would like to know which are these interests, either regional or international. I know about Egypt, uh, how uh, they support uh, Haftar and they've been uh, uh, undertaking airstrikes against some tribes. But which are the rest of the interests and how they affect peace building in, in Libya? Thank you. Yes, uh, please. I see a gentleman here at the corner. Hi, uh, my name is Ahmed, I'm from Libya. Uh, I have two questions actually. One is, uh, uh, given the, the power fragmentation in the country, don't you think that it will take time, it need, well, the country needs time to get to this, to this war fatigue to kick in? I mean, you know, nine women will not deliver a baby in, in one month, so that's the, kind of the first question. The second is, um, uh, the majority of the international community's attention is given to uh, sectors such as security, immigration, and so on, and it's becoming sort of an ambulance chasing approach. Um, don't you think that the, the international community needs to t play the long game in terms of, uh, for example, focusing on economic development, job creation, and so on? And how do you think uh, this shift can happen? Thank you. Uh, thank you for these uh, very relevant questions. I th we can take uh, one more question. If there is someone else, yes, please, the gentleman here. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Benjamin Tito, uh, Chief Coordinator at Gender Consensus International. Uh, and my question uh, concerns uh, the, uh, the point that uh, Dr. Sawani made about the need for a social contract and a shared common vision for the Libyan state and the Libyan nation. And uh, working for an organization that I worked a lot within the constitutional process, uh, I cannot help but think that this should be a great framework to have these uh, discussions within and to create this common uh, vision within. But as we know, this process has uh, stalled, to say the least. And um, uh, so I wonder if, um, First of all, what are some of the main uh, reasons you think that this process has stalled? And if this process is not um, the, the, um, the context in which to, uh, to create this shared vision, then within what framework can, can one do it? Could you just clarify briefly exactly what has stalled in your view? Uh, the constitutional process. The, the constitutional, constitutional process, yeah. okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have um, four questions now, and um, two relate to the uh, involvement of neighboring countries, and is that a positive or a negative factor also when it comes to reconciliation processes nationally? And then, um, does the country need more time for war fatigue to kick in? And is the international community um, not taking too much of an ambulance chasing approach and should should they not look more at the long game and invest in long-term developments of the country, also economically? And then the constitutional process, uh, where is it going? So perhaps I could first invite uh, Dr. Mitty to reflect on uh, the questions on regarding does the country need more time for war fatigue to, to kick in, and should the international community take more of a uh, long-term approach? Yeah, I mean, certainly Libya will, I, I agree, will, will, will take time before it will uh, heal. Uh, but, but at the same time, there are, uh, uh, there is a sense of urgency in, in dealing with a number of questions, the economic questions that uh, Claudia has referred to, security arrangements are probably necessary. Um, you know, I, I, I think it was clear from what I've said that, uh, that I have my, my uh, skepticism as uh, to what the international community has been doing and is capable of doing in the future. Uh, I, uh, if I may, sure. I will link up with a question uh, uh, about the roles of various 
players, regional and beyond, uh, in, in Libya. There was a time where there were lots of countries, whether neighboring or not so neighboring, that had their finger in Libya and their meddling in Libyan affairs. Not only because they wanted to meddle in Libyan affairs, some of them wanted, but because they were invited by Libyans to meddle into their own affairs. They wanted uh, uh, those who uh, had arms from Qatar wanted to fight those who had arms from the Emirates. So they ended up inviting both Qatar and Emirates to give more, more money and arms to, to the various groups. Um, now, uh, I pretend, uh, I stand to be corrected, that, uh, that the interference, uh, international interference, uh, is much narrower than before. It's, it's, uh, there are th three types of interferences, and they all look at Libya from a very narrow lens. One looks at Libya from the narrow lens of counterterrorism, say, the Americans. They know when to send a drone, they know when to kill X or capture Y, uh, cyber attacks, whatever. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the narrow uh, approach. I'm not against counterterrorism, that's not the issue. The issue is that this is a very narrow lens through which you see, you see Libya. There is another very narrow lens that is uh, that is in, uh, not unrelated to counterterrorism, has a sort of expanded definition of terrorist, uh, where they lump every Islamist, or sometimes every uh, devout Muslim, so to speak, uh, within, within the camp of those that need to be combated. There, there are countries that are intervening in Libya that are blinded by their hatred of Islamists. I'm putting it this way. Uh, and you know what countries I'm referring to. Uh, and then there is, of course, the European countries who tend, some European countries who tend to look at Libya from the narrow lens of stopping the influx of illegal migrants. I mean, that's, that's how I see uh, the, the present involvement of the international community in Libya. And, and I see little involvement in in dealing with the real issues that we have debated this evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Dr. Mitri. And I would now like to move on to the other two um, speakers. Um, would you like to reflect on a number of the questions that were just uh, asked, Claudia? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take the question of about why the internationals, international community, um, you know, doesn't focus or is una seems to be unable to focus on um, long-term issues such as the, the economic crisis. And, and I'll take also the question about the constitutional process. Um, I was at a dinner recently with an EU official, and I was trying to explain the economic crisis and how this is also having an impact on the migration file, which as we know is you know, the, the, the most important file for a number of Euro uh, European capitals. So I was explaining how the, this discrepancy in the exchange rate is impacting also the life of migrants in Libya who used to earn you know, $800 a month and with that $800 were able to send half of it home, you know, allow their families to li live de decently in their home countries and, uh, and all the while staying in Tripoli or elsewhere working. And I was saying, you know, now with the economic problems and the black market exchange rate souring, they don't make that much equivalent in foreign currency. So many migrants that have been living in Libya even for decades, and I know a lot of them, are now seeking to flee because they cannot support their families at home, but they can't even survive with what little they earn in, uh, in foreign currency in Libya. And this EU official, was, uh, you know, turned, you know, I had a 10 minute explanation all over this and it says, yeah, yeah, but tell me about the camps, the camps, tell me about the camps. And then uh, it, 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 it was just beyond the understand or, or, or it was difficult for, it was difficult for certain officials to, to go beyond the immediate, the immediate news uh, captivating uh, item. 
Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it is like, that, that is the reality. But I hope that, you know, with uh, increased engagement and increased uh, public discourse on what we think are the core issues that we need to be addressed, and in this sense, I, al I already see a change amongst a number of Western capitals uh, since the new, uh, the, the, the new special envoy, um, my boss, uh, has been addressing this issue of the economic crisis in several Security Council briefings. It has had an echo in Libya and amongst uh, foreign uh, capitals as well. So hopefully, in talking more publicly about this will we'll have a policy, will create a policy shift. Um, I'm already seeing that. Um, I'm already seeing that. Regarding the constitutional process, uh, yes, I mean, uh, um, you are right to, to, to suggest that these, the, the underlying problems that Libya is facing and the solutions to them or this pro proposal to have a new sort of societal contract should be addressed in the constitutional uh, process. But unfortunately, the, the Constitution Drafting Assembly, which was uh, voted in and tasked with uh, drafting uh, a new uh, constitution, um, has reached a, a point of impasse. Its authority is contested not on legal grounds, but on substantial grounds, and the country is divided between those who support this draft constitution, those who say this has to be amended, those who say we have to go back to 1951 constitution, that is the blueprint of the country, and those who say we have to go back to 1963. So there are actually five contested, five different theories on how to proceed with the constitutional process in Libya. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the divisions in the society over whether they support one, one solution or the other is, doesn't, doesn't reflect ideology or political party or regional. It's really on an individual basis. And so how do we go beyond this impasse? One of the proposals that the UN has put on the table in its action plan is to create this moment of gathering, this multaqal watani, this uh, national conference. And in the agenda of this national conference where key Libyan stakeholders from across the country, from you know, across, uh, including those who are currently abroad, um, um, one of the issues on the agenda uh, presumably will be to how, how to proceed with the constitutional process because at the moment this is a, a very controversial issue that cannot be resolved politically uh, as, as I see it. Thank you. And Dr. Savani, would you like to offer your thoughts on some of the questions and perhaps also the idea of that national conference, which is part of the action plan presented by the current UN Special Representative? How, how do you feel about that, also being a political scientist, perhaps? Well, I personally think that the idea of holding or organizing a national conference uh, uh, should be approached uh, in a manner of a peace conference, because this country has been living uh, in a civil war uh, situation for the last six or seven years. And uh, there are winners and losers, as Dr. Mitri has rightly uh, characterized the situation ever since 2011. And the contestation has uh, be, become wider. Uh, and the, uh, the, the issues, uh, around which the contestation is, uh, is, is evolves, are uh, are multiple: uh, economic, regional, tribal, eth eth ethnic, uh, and you name it. Uh, so, uh, any national conference should be uh, part of a larger national reconciliation process. A national reconciliation process must understand and spring from the understanding that Libya has been going through a civil war situation. Uh, take the constitutional process as an example. Uh, it has not been uh, inclusive. Uh, representatives of what we call in Libya uh, cultural groups, i.e. ethnicities or ethnic groups, 
have boycotted the CDA or the Constitutional Drafting uh, Authority uh, since the beginning. And the draft that was voted by majority of, of members of the CDA is contested in courts and it's uh, very likely that it will fail before the courts. Uh, many members are against it, uh, especially uh, in the eastern part of the country where federalist orientations are rather strong and where tribalism is also very influential and where, by the way, Haftar and his Libyan National Army is controlling the region after being able to crush Islamists and their supporters and uh, uh, bring the region into a state of relative security and stability. So the, the idea is needs to be qualified. If it is just a gathering of some representatives, of some factions to just talk and uh, you know, nice talks about national reconciliation, national unity, uh, that would uh, definitely lead to nothing and just add up to different previous failures of national dialogue. But if it was uh, done and approached with idea of peace, agreement, with uh, a consensus on a vision for the country, a societal contract, then a constitution through a constitutional process, and then what follows, uh, I think it is the only uh, way that can take Libya to uh, peace and stability in the future. Regional uh, actors uh, have different interests and probably one of the uh, major issues, ma major actually uh, the, uh, concerns of many Libyans is the role played by Algeria and Egypt in particular. Uh, they have different agendas uh, and I think nothing really could be achieved uh, unless there, there, is some, there is some kind of an agreement between Algeria and Egypt. Dr. Mitri referred to different international regional actors uh, you know, doing different things, uh, but I also uh, must remind ourselves that right from 2011, there were some regional uh, actors who interfered in Libya, by first by militarizing the uprising against, against Gaddafi, and then by advocating, encouraging, supporting, and even financing the contestation between the so-called Islamists and liberals to the point where many devout Muslims were considered secular uh, and against Islam, uh, to the point where, and after the, the results of the first elections 2012, which was won by the so-called liberals, uh, uh, was considered a victory for supporters of the Gaddafi regime. Uh, so this kind of narrative an advocacy of revolution and counter-revolution, winners and losers, uh, cities of revolution, city of blah, 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 uh, has been quite instrumentally damaging uh, national unity, national fabric, and has just uh, distracted uh, any prospect for uh, social peace so far. And without addressing those issues, I think there is no prospect for peace and reconciliation as well. Thank you. We, we have time for one more round of questions. So if there are questions, please raise your hand. And I see a number of hands raised. Um, we'll start with a gentleman here in the first row, if you can get there. Could you please identify yourself? Uh, Basel Haj Jassim. Uh, my question for Dr. Mitri. If Russia intervenes militarily, uh, your opinion, what uh, will the results be? Could you repeat the question because I couldn't hear Russia. it? Russia, Russia, Russia. okay. Russia. Uh, yeah. 
if if Russia intervened militarily in Libya, what would be the consequences? Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> um, I saw a number of other hands raised there. Yes, the gentleman here in the um, in the middle. Yes. Good evening. My name is uh, Rob Hibos. I heard a lot of this evening a lot of suggestions, but none of them sounds to me very optimistic. And it doesn't sound that you are convinced that it will help. So maybe a totally different approach. Why not uh, for the next 10 years, Libya is becoming a UN protectorate under international, international yes. governance. And in the 10 years, they have the possibility to develop a notion of statehood, station, a statehood where it's, it's, it's missing at this moment. It's a suggestion. Yeah, that's certainly uh, thinking out of the box, I would say. But um, I'll, um, I'm interested to hear what our speakers uh, have to say about it. I saw someone else there in the corner raising his hand for a while, so please. Thanks. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for their very lucid introductions, especially the historic introduction by Mr. Sawani. He explained that uh, Libya never has been a very organic uh, country. So could one of, be, one of the solutions be uh, splitting Libya again, a sort of two-state solution for Libya? That's my question. Are you speaking about two-state or...? or <laughs> Any amount of states, just Two, to complicate four, matters. Two, four, six, nine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, Libya traditionally has three provinces, so perhaps it would be three then. We'll take one more question. I see um, the lady here in the middle. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Ellen van der Velde, working for Doctors Without Borders. Um, I'd like to uh, bring a little bit the attention also back to uh, some of the ambulance work that I think really does need to be done. Um, and that's the position of, uh, of migrants, specifically migrants in detention and all forms of captivity. Um, although structural solutions are incredibly important, um, there's people uh, locked up uh, tonight, today, and people are dying on a daily basis because of the circumstances under which they're kept. Are there, from within Libya, to your idea, any suggestions or possibilities to uh, improve on the somewhat short term, because it's very urgent, uh, the plight of these people? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, well, um, I would now like to um, give the floor back to the speakers, and I believe we have a certain um, a sense that the audience would also like to think a little bit in terms of solutions for what we have heard um, here tonight, which is of course not very, very, very easy at all. But um, well, there some suggestions have been made. UN protectorate would that ever be an option? Um, splitting up the country, uh, which is of course um, those suggestions come up regularly in op-eds and other pieces, so I, it would be interesting to hear your views on that. And then, um, are there any, do you have information on what's being done on the situation of migrants in detention centers in Libya and um, Russia's, Russia's position or policy vis-a-vis -vis Libya? So perhaps, Dr. Savani, could I invite you to reflect on any of those questions? Yeah, uh, let me start with the migrants yes. issue because it's been, you know, flared and glared probably in the media since the uh, report by CNN. Uh, let me, uh, you know, uh, uh, respective of everything I've, I've said tonight, Libyans are moderate, generally moderate. They don't uh, have xenophobic attitudes. Uh, much of the issues surrounding the life and the conditions of m migrants, especially Africans in, in Libya, dates back to 2011, when there was this rumor that Gaddafi forces were using African mercenaries to crush the uprisings, which tend to be false. 
to a greater degree. Uh, Africans have been flocking uh, into Libya. Uh, millions of them have been living in Libya for for years, enjoying almost equal rights as Libyans, uh, when there were rights for Libyans, of course. Uh, they, they were working in all sectors, including government. What happened, what has been happening uh, during the Gaddafi era and right after that was human trafficking. This was, you know, ordinary business carried out during the Gaddafi era, but it intensified after the fall of the regime because there was no security apparatus to deal with the situation. There was no central control that as Gaddafi used to employ uh, the issue of migration and human trafficking against Europe. Uh, to secure concessions from Europe on political or economic issues. Uh, when the whole thing disintegrated, uh, militias, gangsters were very much involved. And uh, many uh, gangsters and, uh, and, and criminal circles, rings, uh, are not only Libyans. They are Africans, Arab, Europeans, you name it. It's the same with, with smuggling fuel. But fuel goes to European destinations, and the beneficiaries are Europeans. So European naval ships and boats and guards, they just turn a blind eye to, to those boats. But they want to intercept migrants. Uh, they obstructed the work of NGOs or humanitarian organizations. And they entered into deals with militias to stop the migrants before they go to Europe and bring them back to Libya in exchange for financial deals, lucrative financial deals. So what would be the result? Detention centers crowded. And the situation would deteriorate. Worse still, because of these uh, uh, financial advantages and privileges, militias and gangsters started to compete and trade in migrants. So it's not really slavery, but it is the fact that a migrant who wants to migrate to Europe by boats is being sold from one trafficker to another to do the job say the poor African or Asian, Egyptian, Moroccan, Tunisian, paid to the first trafficker a thousand Libyan dinar, for example, then this trafficker is no longer interested, probably because he struck a deal with some foreign government, you know, decides to get rid of this, this stock, so, so to speak, or this migrants. So he sells them to another trafficker. Then, Take, this takes place like an, uh, an auction. And this is the real story behind the so-called slavery in Libya. There are hundreds of thousands of, of migrants, especially Africans, living peacefully in Libya. They suffer more because of the economic hardships, because of the instability and insecurity ongoing, especially after 2014. The so-called Presidential Council, which is the internationally recognized legitimate authority of Libya, is not even recognized or endorsed by Libyan judiciary. It's illegal. It has not been endorsed by the House of Representatives. It has no actual authority. It is under the influence of militias. Still, it entered into a deal with Italy this deal was considered illegal and unconstitutional by the courts in the country. But, you know, everyone just turned a blind eye. And, you know, they, the agreement went into uh, effect. 
uh, uh, leading into consolidating the influence of militias. So, Mr. Savani, if I could briefly interrupt you, what you're, if I understand you correctly, what you're suggesting is that the, uh, the Libyan authorities actually do not really have the authority or the control to Even according act. to the Libyan political agreement, they don't have the legitimacy mm -hmm. because they have to be endorsed by the House of Representatives, which has denied to do so. Okay, the House of Representatives accepted the names of the members of the Presidential Council, but it has not ratified the Libyan political agreement. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's in limbo legally. There is, there is no legal authority, doesn't have the legitimacy according to the LBA itself or according to Libyan laws. There were cases, many cases against the Presidential Council before Libyan courts, East and West, uh, in which you know, it failed. To, to, to get recognition. In particular, this protocol and agreement that it signed with, with Italy. Mm -hmm. It was considered null, or it was nullified by Tripoli courts. So this is one, one, uh, one, one important issue that I wanted to, to clarify. Uh, Thank you. Yes, there were a number of other questions, but I was thinking maybe perhaps Dr. Mitri could reflect on the question of um, UN protectorate, and is, is, is a division ever an option in the future? How would you yeah, feel can, about can that? Would, would you like to say something yeah, about just that? Just to okay. clarify, because I think yeah. I, I, I probably I was misunderstood, I, or I mis, misrepresented my views. I said Libya as an entity, as a nation state, is a new phenomenon, so to speak, and it has most of its history, the region was ruled by alien governments, not, not kind of national governments. Probably the exception and between inverted commas was Gaddafi's rule. This is not obviously an advantage to Gaddafi, but this is, this is history. Uh, and uh, 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 this doesn't mean that Libya was not unified. It was unified under the Ottomans, it was unified under the Turks, it was in the, uh, unified under the Italians. It temporarily during the interwar, the, the, uh, the post uh, Second World War, it was subject to different uh, military administrations by the British, the French, and the Italian British in, 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 in Tripoli. But the country was, you know, one country, even though there were some kind of peculiarities uh, uh, for, for each three main regions. Tripolitania, Fizan, and Siranika, or Barqa. But it was a, a country that was mostly ruled by foreigners. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Could I give the floor to you for some reflections? Yeah, I, I uh, question on Russia. Russian. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, the Russians, as cynical as they can be, are very happy to see Libya descend into chaos. And they keep reminding the Americans and the Europeans of their failures. Say, so you intervened in Libya, this is the result. And the worse it gets in Libya, the, the stronger is this argument against intervention. I, I can testify to this. I've been, I've briefed the Security Council 11 times and 11 times the Russian representative said this. Uh, so it's not just once or twice or three times. Uh, the, uh, the other, which is, and then I will link up with uh, this uh, question of uh, UN trusteeship. Uh, the Russians and many others, Brazil, China, Germany, and uh, were happy in a way, to see a serious blow to uh, the responsibility to protect. And, uh, and they would like to see the world swing back to being a, a world of sovereign states whose sovereignty is scrupulously respected no matter how mass atrocities are perpetrated by regimes, whether it's in Syria or anywhere else in the world. Uh, the world now 
is more than ever before, the United Nations more than ever before, is a constellation of sovereign states. Like it or not, that's another story. The age of trusteeship is gone. And it won't come back for the very reason I have just mentioned. But then I will add, in answer to the question about splitting Libya into many states, three, six, nine, or 12, uh, the world has no appetite for new states. I think Masoud Barazani didn't, uh, didn't understand that. He thought that the world has an appetite for new states, and he failed, uh, tragically. Libyans have no appetite for more states, I believe. There are Libyans who would like to see better distribution of resources among the regions, especially people in Cyrenaica who say all the resources are in the east, but we don't get our good share of resources. There are federalists in, uh, in Libya. They lost elections in the beginning. They lost in the second round. They did a little better in the third round. Uh, so a federal Libya might be in the cards, but splitting Libya into many states, whether three or more, doesn't sound realistic as far as I could see. There is neither a Libyan demand nor an international appetite. Thank you, Dr. Mitri. Claudia, I would like to give you a last opportunity to also respond to a number of the questions that were raised. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just respond to this question about, you know, why not divide Libya? Um, you know, those who, those, those who do suggest this, and there are a number of so-called editorialists that have published articles uh, proposing uh, the division of Libya as a solution of the current crisis, uh, generally use sort of two arguments. One is historically Libya is made of three regions, Fezzan, uh, Tarablus, and Barca, uh, and so why not respect this uh, historical um, uh, ge geography and, and chop up the country? This is one line. Uh, the other uh, rationale for division is, well, you know, there are two parliaments and two government, one in the east and one in the west. Why don't we divide it according to this uh, uh, political division? Everybody will already have a government and will already have a parliament. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, um, the HOR in Tobruk doesn't represent the East, and the State Council in Tripoli doesn't represent the West of the country. There are some politicians that would like to frame these two institutions as the Parliament of the West and the Parliament of the East, and that is sort of a, 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 a never publicly stated uh, goal of certain politicians. But currently, these two institutions are not Parliament of the West or Parliament of the East. When we convened uh, uh, the redrafting committees uh, to the UN headquarters in, um, in Tunis, the drafting, sorry, the drafting committees for the amendments of the LPA, and there were the two delegations, uh, one from the State Council, which is a Tripoli-based uh, assembly, and one from the House of Representatives, which is a Tobruk-based um, uh, parliament. Well, the heads of the two delegations were one from the West, meaning the head of the House of Representative delegation, so the parliament in the East, the head of that delegation was a gentleman, or is a gentleman from Zintan, which is outside of Tripoli. And the head of the delegation of the, um, of the um, High State Council, so the Tripoli-based institution, is actually a gentleman from Ajdabia, from the east of the country. So, um, so th this, this to tell you that this east-west political division doesn't exist in reality. Um, uh, and so I, 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 I push very, very strongly against those who adopt this very simplified uh, proposal for the solution of the Libyan crisis. Uh, I would actually dare say that any move towards a division, a political division of Libya, would exacerbate the conflict rather than solving it. 
Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. And I think um, we've come to the end of this discussion. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight and for engaging in this uh, complex but very important debate. Like always, I would like to invite you to have a drink with us afterwards. And in concluding, I would like to refer to a story that I was told recently by an um, American archaeologist who is working on the preservation of a cultural heritage in Libya. Since 2011, she brings teams of Libyans for training purposes to the United States. And one of these teams visited the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, D.C., um, which um, bears a quote from his famous I Have a Dream speech. And the quote is, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And this became a mantra for these young Libyans and an inspiration that they took home. Out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And I believe to some extent, this is what we have also tried to look for tonight, a stone of hope. And it may have been a very small stone we found, but I think we sure did our best. So I would like to thank our distinguished speakers tonight for being here. It has been a great honor for us. Thank you so much for traveling all the way to Amsterdam to share your expertise and your experience with us. Please give them a warm round of applause.